One of his family told me that's because he is an oldie and goodie. <laughs> if you have your Bibles with you tonight, I invite you to open them to Revelation chapter 4. As we once again pick up in our study of the book of Revelation, I told you when we began it will take the entire year plus some. We're in no rush. I want you to understand the book. I want you to understand the prophecies of the book. And therefore, we're at times moving fast, but moving slow. Moving slow, but moving fast. Revelation chapter 4. Let's do a quick review since it's been a few weeks since we have been in the book. The outline of the book of Revelation is given to us very early on in the book. In fact, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, gives us the three-part outline of this book written by the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos to those of his day and to those of all days. Let me read it to you. If you have your Bibles, you might just want to flip there, Revelation 1, verse 19. But don't leave Revelation 4 because we are going to be back there in just a few minutes. But John gives us this three-part outline of the book. This is how he's going to approach the book as he is led by the Spirit of God. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen. Part 1. Write those things that you have seen. Write those things that are. Thirdly, write those things that are to take place after this. That is the three-part outline of the book of Revelation. Part one deals with yesterday. It deals with the past. It deals with things that John has seen. And chapter one tells us what he has seen. He has seen that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's a good place for an amen. Jesus Christ is Lord. We don't make him Lord. He is Lord. We acknowledge his lordship. He is Lord. He's Lord of creation. He's Lord of salvation. He is God Almighty. And then John moves us on to the second part of the book of Revelation. If we're outlining the book. Part two is those things that are being seen. Today, the present, in chapters 2 and 3, that's what he talks about. The things that were going on in his time. Not the things of yesterday, not the things of tomorrow, not the past, not the future, but today, the present. And in chapters 2 and 3, we saw that the church age is now taking place. The church age is broke up into seven eras. Seven eras of time encompassing about 2,000 years. The church age began with the church at Ephesus, the era of Ephesus, if you will. And it is going to end in the era that we're in right now, the era of Laodicea, the church of Laodicea as represented. And we saw that each era in Revelation 2 and 3 is represented by a church that describes that period in history. We are now moving tonight into the third part of his outline. And this part will last us all the way to the end of the book. So part one is the past, Revelation 1. Part two is the present, Revelation 2 and 3, the church age. Part three is those things that are coming. Eschatology, those things that are coming that John is going to see. We're talking about tomorrow. We're talking about the future. It's interesting to note that he's talked about the church in Revelation 2 and 3 repeatedly. Talked about the eras. Talked about the churches. Commended the churches. Condemned the churches. Praised the churches. Scolded the churches. But as you go into Revelation 4, the church is never mentioned again. There's not one single mention of the church. 
Is that accidental? Is that coincidental? Is John forgetful that he fumbled the ball? No, 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 and no. There's a reason why the church isn't mentioned in Revelation chapter 4 going all the way to the end of the book. It's because the church is not here no more. The church has disappeared. The church has been raptured. The next event on God's prophetic calendar, it's future, but we don't know how far future is. As Gary said, future could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be next month. It could be next year. It could be 10 years from now. It could be tonight. No man knows the day and the hour of the rapture of the church, the first phase of Christ's return. But in Revelation 4, we move into part 3. Now, what is the rapture? Because that word's not used in the Bible. And many people who are critical of the word, they, they point that out. Where's the word in the Bible? Well, it's not in the Bible. But references are made to it. Descriptions are made of it. Representations are made of it. You know, Trinity is not used in the Bible either. But there is a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Just be, it, and it's there. Although the word is not there. And rapture's not used. But... There is descriptions of it. There's references of it. There's representations of it. One day, in this event called the rapture, all born-again believers, not all church members, all born-again believers who have given their sin to Jesus and Jesus has given them their salvation, they have been born again. They're heaven-born. They're going to be heaven-bound. He's going to pull them up and out of this world. And he's going to do it in love. And he's going to do it with power. I'd like to you to look at three references with me real quick tonight. Because I want to show you how this event is spoken of in the scriptures. But yet the name's not necessarily used. In Revelation chapter 4 verse 1. I want you to notice now... John, John is taking us into a new outline of the book, a new part. And notice what he says, and I wonder again, is this just accidental? Or is this a fundamental he's trying to teach us? After this, Revelation 4 verse 1, I looked. John says, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me was like a trumpet. Interesting. We've heard the trumpet talked about before, haven't we? And particularly by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. When he's talking about this event, same event. Why would John say, Paul said there will be a sound of a trumpet. John says, I looked up and I saw heaven. I saw a door open. And I heard a sound that sounded to me like a trombone, a guitar, a drum. Is that what he said? No. He said a what? A trumpet. A trumpet. And it said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. John says, at once I was in the spirit and I behold a throne. In Revelation 4, 1, we see the phrase, come up here. Can I give you a literal translation or understanding of that phrase, come up here? It, it means a movement by an upward, powerful force. John says, I heard a voice say, come up here. I, I, I felt the movement. Of a powerful force that was lifting me upward. That's what he's saying. And I found myself in heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. The apostle Paul writing before John wrote this. Talking about this next event in God's calendar of prophecy, of eschatology. In 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Apostle Paul talks about 
being caught up together. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, 17, and 18. Verses that describe to us the rapture. And Paul says, we shall be caught up together. That phrase, caught up together, coincides with what John says when he says, I was told to come up here. Caught up together. You know what that literally means? Of movement by an upward powerful force that involves multitudes of people. John says it was just me. Paul says it's going to be together. A multitude of people. Millions upon millions upon millions of people instantaneously are leaving this world. And we'll be with him. These born again believers that make up the true church, God's church. Remember the church is not a building, it's a people. It's a people who have been saved. You can be a part of the earthly church but not be part of God's church. So one day, there's going to be a powerful upward movement. A movement that will lift the people of God out of this world and take them to God's world. And it won't just be one. It won't be ten. It won't be a hundred. It won't be a thousand. There'll be literally millions all across this world that will disappear. Come up here. Caught up together. And then in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 52, the Apostle Paul once again gives us another little inkling of the rapture. He says not only will it be a, 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 an upward powerful force, an upward powerful force that will lift many people, but he says it will be an upward powerful force that involves many people, which will happen fast and it will happen in love. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says it will happen in the twinkling of an eye. Now most people believe that the twinkling of an eye means a blink. People who study blinks of the eye say that a blink is about one-eighth of a second. So when this rapture occurs, it's going to happen quick. It'll happen so fast, here today, gone tomorrow. You'll be sitting next to somebody. They'll scratch their head, turn away, turn back, and you're gone. But it's also something that will not only happen fast, it will happen in love. It will happen in love. You know what the twinkling of an eye means? It's a phrase that was used in the Apostles' Day. It means to see something fast that you're attracted to and have affection for. Wow. This one who's going to Take us upward. This one who's going to take us upward with a powerful moving force. This one who's going to take us upward all together. He has the power to take us all at one time. He's going to do it so fast. But we will see his face for just a moment as he's doing it. And it will be a face of love. A face of affection. A face that says I care. The rapture of the church that we're talking about as we go into Revelation 4 is likened to a marriage in the Bible. A marriage reception. How many of you have ever been to a wedding reception? Raise your hand. If you haven't been to one, it, maybe it was yours. I don't, I don't know. But in a wedding reception, now the wedding ceremony is, is different. But when you get to the reception, everybody's kind of let their hair down now. The, the formal clothes have been taken off sometimes and the informal clothes are put on. People that are, were tense and nervous and shaken, all of a sudden now they're just relaxed. People that were hot around the collar, now cool as cucumbers. I mean, a wedding reception is full of celebration. They're singing, there's dancing, there's shouting. There's rejoicing, 
There's eating. There's just a good time with one another. You think it's just again by accident that the Bible speaks of the, when Jesus comes to get his church that he who is the groom, Jesus, is going to unite with the church that's his bride. They will be together again. It will be a time of celebration in heaven that we have never seen before in this world. So the rapture takes God's people up. Takes us up with a powerful force. Takes us up all together. Takes us up in one eighth of a second. And takes us up to one who loves us and we love him. And all of a sudden we find ourselves in a marriage reception. A celebration taking place. But also the rapture of the church is likened to calling an ambassador home. Before war begins. It is diplomatic protocol before you go to war against another nation. You always call your ambassador and the embassy staff home. You'll always do that. And once again, we are called to be ambassadors for Christ. To share his truth and show his love to a world out there who knows nothing about him or his kingdom. We're his ambassadors But when the rapture takes place, he's taking his ambassadors, he's taking his embassy staff, he's taking them out of here because war is coming to earth. And we're going to be in a place that will be safe and secure. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16, Paul also talks to us about a sequence of how that is going to occur. Now, we've given you some biblical references, and that's not all of them, but I think it's enough for you to understand what the rapture is. We've also looked at some representations of it. It's a wedding reception. It's a a calling of the embassy staff home before war is declared. But then, in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16, Paul gives us the order of what's going to happen. And remember, all of this happens quickly. I know I'm taking about 10 minutes to give it to you, but I'm telling you, it's going to happen far quicker than that. Paul says there'll be a shout. There'll be a voice. There'll be the blasting of a trumpet. There'll be the resurrection of the dead in Christ, immediately followed by the rapture of the living in Christ. And the resurrected saints, the raptured saints, will all be together. At the marriage reception and at the calling home of the ambassador and the embassy staff. What is the shout that Paul speaks of that's going to occur? Remember when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus? Now you help me out. My memory isn't good. He got outside that tomb and he said, hey, you in there. Hey, buddy, come on out. Is that what he said? He called Lazarus by what? He called him by name. The Lord Jesus knows our name. The devil knows numbers. He numbers his people, but God knows the names of his people. And when he comes in the rapture, he will call our name. The born again will hear their name called. And as their name is being called, we will feel this tremendous power moving us upward. And we will be transformed as we go up. In the twinkling of an eye, one-eighth of a second, we will see the face of the one who died for us, but loves us that we can love him. Up we go. If the rapture was to occur right now, you would hear your name. The voice, the shout. But then there will be the voice of the archangel. Many people believe it to be Michael. And he will have an order for us. Angels give orders. And his order to his church will be, to God's church, will be come. Jesus calls our name. And the angel says come. 
And a corridor will be made. And up we will go through that corridor. Through that door that John calls it. A door has confines, doesn't it? It's a certain dimension. And if you go through the door, you have to go through the dimensions of the door. Well, there will be a door, a corridor that will be formed. That will take us from this world to that world. Because Satan, who's the God of this age, the God of this world, is going to do whatever he can to stop the exodus. Stop the evacuation. He hates the church. He wants to finish the church off. But God loves the church and God's going to spare the church. And secure the church and that will be done in the rapture and we will be in heaven. And then a trumpet will sound. That's what John said. He said, I heard a trumpet. The trumpet will blast. The shout of our name. The voice of the archangel giving an order to come up. And the power for us to do that will be vested in us. And then the trump will sound. And in the Bible, the trumpet is always significant of several things. But one thing it's always significant of is war is coming. The ambassador is called home. The embassy staff is called home. And now the trumpet sounds declaring war. The final seven years of history are about to unfold. The showdown is going to occur between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit versus Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The last seven years, as we're going to see in messages to come, is going to be messages of war. God's people will be in heaven, but hell will break out down here. There will be war. Having said all of that, and I hope that you understand it a little bit better, we're waiting on the rapture. I want us to look at just four things from our text real quick at Revelation chapter 4. Once again, in verse 1, John says, After this I looked, and behold, there was a door. A specified dimension, old door. A corridor standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here. Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. Outline number one is the past. Outline number two is the present. Outline number three is the future. I will show you what must take place after this. Interesting, John says, I was in the Spirit. I was in the Spirit. And I beheld a throne that stood in heaven with one seated on that throne. I want us to look at four things real quick. All involving the word look. First thing I want us to see from verse 2. John says, I looked up from heaven's gate. I'm at the gate of heaven. And I look up and I see some things, I think you would say to us. I first of all see the beam of platform. Those of you who were with us last Sunday morning, I spent a lot of time talking about the beam of platform. It's a platform, a stage, if you will, that's in heaven. Main Street Heaven at the intersection. And on that platform sits a throne. And on that throne is the King of Glory, Jesus Christ. And all the saints of all the ages one day in formation will face that platform, will face Jesus on His throne. And they will be called one by one to the platform. Some to be rewarded for their service their stewardship, others to be not so rewarded for their service and stewardship. But everybody will be called, and one by one we'll come. And those of us who have served him and served him well, he will reward us with crowns that he will place on our head, and we will take those crowns and lay them at his feet, because there's only one king in heaven, and his name is Jesus 
And some of you looking at me right now, you will be well crowned. You will be well rewarded because you've taken the things that God gave to you and you used them for his glory. You worshiped him for his glory. You witnessed for him for his glory. You served him for, for his glory. You gave to him for his glory. You praised him and prayed to him and read the scriptures for his glory. Everything that God gave to you, you used wisely to magnify him. Whether that was working in the nursery or working with our Awana kids or scooping up beans for a church function, you did what God asked you to do and you did it well and you did it for him. Down here, nobody knows who you are. Up there, they will. As your name is called one by one. The Bema seat platform. I'm sure John, when he looked it up into heaven, he saw that platform. He saw that throne. He saw Jesus who will sit on that throne and make those judgments. Please note it's Jesus on the throne. It's not Buddha. It's not Muhammad. It's not Har Krishna. It's not Sun Moon. It won't be O Buddha sitting on the throne. It won't be O Muhammad calling you home. It won't be Hare Krishna playing that trumpet sound. We're going to see the sun, not Reverend Moon. Imperials, 1979. You ought to look that song up. That's pretty good. They sing it better than I did. John says, I looked up and I saw that beam of platform where the decorations will be given to God's people. You say, Pastor, I don't care. As long as I just make it, you'll care. When you come up there and you have nothing to give or nothing to receive, you'll cry because you're going to be standing before the one who will have nails in his hands and scars on his head the one who gave it all for you at Calvary, and yet you couldn't give him much at all because you chose not to do it. Secondly, you'll see something else. You'll see the the marriage reception hall. Remember the marriage? Maybe John saw that. Maybe that's a big place in heaven. It'd have to be big. I imagine you could have half a billion people there. You know who will be there? The saints of the church age. Every born again believer who's part of the church that began in the era of Ephesus and concludes at the era of Laodicea. Every born again believer who comes to know Jesus in that time frame is part of the church. The church is the bride. So we here today... If the rapture was to occur, we would be part of the bride that will marry Jesus in heaven and part of the reception to follow. Now, you're a smart group, and some of you are saying, well, what about the Old Testament saints? They're not part of the church, but they'll be there. Got to have a witness when you do a wedding, right? What about the tribulation saints who will be dying for their faith in the tribulation? That's seven years. Well, they, they'll be there too. But they'll be there as witnesses as well. The groom is Jesus. The church is the born again believers of the church era. And remember when the rapture occurs. The church age is over. You know we make a big ado about royal weddings. (laughs) This will be a royal wedding. King Jesus. Taking on his bride. Uniting with his bride the church. Will the angels be there? I believe so. What a a thing that's going to have to be. So we look up from heaven's gate. John says, I saw the Bema seat platform. I saw the marriage hall. And I believe his heart's going boom, 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 boom. He's all excited. And then he takes another look. He looked up and saw the Bema platform. He looked up and saw the marriage hall. Hall, the reception hall, but he also looked around when he was at heaven's gate. 
And in verses 4 through 10, if you have your Bible open, he saw some things that I don't believe he had ever seen before. Some of them he was familiar with. A lot of them he probably struggled to know what they were. In verse 4 through 10, I want you to just kind of follow. I'm not going to read all of the verses, but I want you to notice in verse 4, the first thing he saw as he looked around now. Not, he already looked up. Now he's going to look around. He sees 24 elders. Verse 4, 24 elders. I wonder who those elders are. He doesn't really identify them. But other places in the Bible give us hints, give us directives of who they might be. But he sees 24 elders. I submit to you that those elders represent two things that God loves more than anything else. He loves the nation of Israel and he loves the church. And 12 of those elders represent the patriarchs of Israel. And the other 12 of those elders represent the apostles of the church. Representatives of the nation of Israel. Representatives of the church. The elders, they're there. And John sees them. He also says in verse 6, he sees a sea of glass. This sea of glass, according to people who are far smarter than me, is a reference to the Bible, the Word of God. The sea of glass is the Word of God. A, a, a word that is perfect, a word that is pure, just like that sea of glass is. Crystal is known for its perfection and its purity, and there's only one thing that is perfect and pure outside of the Godhead. It's the Word of God. The Bible, the B-I-B-L-E, is the sea of glass. In every book in the Bible, Jesus is the hero. If you read your Bible and you don't see Jesus in it, read it again. He's in every book of the Bible. Every book of the Bible, He's there. Sometimes he's in the light, you can see him clearly. Sometimes he's in the shadows and you have to look at him, uh, you have to find him there. He's, he's a little subtle, not overt, but he's the hero of the entire Bible. The sea of glass is the word of God is there. The 24 elders are there, the patriarchs of Israel, the apostles of the church. Verse 7, there's four creatures there. The Bible calls them living creatures because there's nothing dead in heaven. Everything's alive. Four living creatures in verse 7. These creatures have six wings and they have many eyes. That means they're fast and it means they're smart. Swift and smart they are. And they look like Jesus. If you hang around somebody long enough, you will talk like them. You'll act like them. You'll dress like them. You'll have their same likes and their same dislikes. You say, Pastor, how do you know that? How many of you folks been married over 30 years? Raise your hand. Would you not agree? Old married couples can finish each other's sentences before they get it out of their mouth. And these four creatures, they have been around Jesus, and they've taken on him. Notice that one of the creatures is like a lion. You know, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, portrays Jesus as royalty. And what is the lion known as? The king of the beasts. And so one of these four creatures, he has the face of a lion. He's royalty. Jesus is a king. That's why Matthew gives us that lineage in chapter 1. Nobody likes to read. Everybody skips over Matthew chapter 1 because they say, I don't understand it. The whole purpose of that lineage is to show us that David, that Jesus is a descendant of David. And David was a king and so is Jesus. And then one of the living creatures has the face of an ox or a calf. 
and Mark's gospel, Jesus is betrayed as a peasant, as a servant. Not one who comes to serve, to be served, but one who comes to serve. That's why Mark's book is full of miracles. Because Jesus came to serve. He came to serve by healing people. He came to serve by teaching people. He came to serve by doing miracles to people. He came to serve by giving people salvation. So, so they have the face of a lion because Jesus is royalty. They have the face of an ox or a calf because Jesus is peasantry. He's a servant. And then one of the creatures, one of the four, has the face of a man. Is it just accidental? Is it just coincidental? I'm trying to make you think. God has everything lined up perfectly. This, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is portrayed in his humanity. Jesus is a man, 100% man. And then John comes along, and in the Gospel of John, he portrays Jesus as an eagle, which is a symbol of deity. These four creatures represent a Jesus who's royalty, who's peasantry, who's humanity, and who's deity all rolled into one. Pastor, is Jesus man? Yes. Is he God? Yes. Are you saying he's a 200% person? Yes, yes. That's exactly who I'm saying he is. And then John sees as the 24 elders, he sees the sea of glass, he sees the four creatures. And in verse 8 through 11, he sees Jesus being worshipped as creator. A worship service is unfolding in Revelation chapter 4 is John sees worship. There's war on earth, but there's worship in heaven. And Jesus is, re, re, is, is worshipped as creator. Remember, he is Lord of creation. There's no monkey business. There's no alien clones. There's no big bang. There's no electrified particles. Jesus is the creator. Everyone and everything were created by him. Everything has a plan. Everything has a purpose. He's creator. There's worship going on. But let's thirdly move on now. We've looked up. John saw the Bema platform. He saw the, the wedding reception hall. He envisioned the saints being called up to the platform to be rewarded. He envisioned that great celebration where God's people will smile, they will laugh, they will dance, they will shout, they will rejoice because they're united with the one who loves them and they love him. And then John looks around and he sees worship. 24 elders worshiping. A sea of glass, the word of God there. He sees four creatures that are representations of Jesus himself. He sees all of the worship that's breaking out simultaneously in heaven. Jesus enters the room and everybody begins to worship. If a president comes in, we stand to our feet and applaud. When Jesus comes in, we fall to the floor on our face. He's worshiped. But now let's not only look up and look around, but let's look back. From heaven's gate with John. I wonder what John was thinking when he saw all of this. I wonder, just wonder, this is my theorization, speculation, opinionation. I wonder if he didn't think about right there. You know, we don't give the cross a whole lot of thought sometimes down here. We acknowledge it, we tip our hat to it, we salute it. But how many of us really understand the depth of everything that took place there? I believe John looked back to Golgotha's Hill, to Mount Moriah, to Calvary. And I believe he saw Jesus Christ on that cross. 
He saw Jesus on a cross suspended on two beams, suspended between heaven and earth. He who knew no sin would now become our sin. And the wages of our sin is life. Is that correct? Just checking you out. The wages of sin is what? Therefore, he had to go there, didn't he? He couldn't pay for our sin without paying for it with his shed blood and with his life. And John is there in heaven. And he looks back to Calvary. And he sees the suffering of Jesus. He sees the bleeding of Jesus. He sees the dying of Jesus for his sins. And I know the Bible doesn't say it, but I believe he wept. How can you not cry when you see what he did for us? That should have been us. We should have been crucified. We should have suffered and died. We should have hung on that cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, did what? He'll finish it out. He took our place. Don't you ever forget that. The price that was paid that we could be sons and daughters of God and inheritors to the kingdom of heaven. Then lastly, as we conclude, we've looked up, we've looked around, we've looked back with John as he stands at heaven's gate. But maybe, just maybe now, John is going to take one more look. Because there's something going on in this old world that he's left. And he peeks and he looks down. And what he saw is going to unfold in Revelation 5 and 6 and the remaining chapters of the book. He is horrified what he sees. He is frightened with what he sees. He is terrorized by what he sees. He agonizes with what he sees. What he is seeing take place on earth. He cannot comprehend. And when we go through this book, you're going to not be able to comprehend the teachings that I'm going to share with you. What is he going to see? He's going to see Russia and Iran form a coalition of, along with other allies. We're seeing the beginning of it. We're going to see the end of it. Russia and Iran join their hands. And they will attack Israel in another Pearl Harbor. They're going to take Israel out. And they're going to do it themselves. No proxies this time. They will do it themselves. And John sees this sneak attack take place. He sees Israel overwhelmed on the verge of extermination, extinction. He sees the Jewish people about to be annihilated. And he cries. World War III has begun on planet Earth. He sees the Antichrist and the false prophet. He sees them put together their new world order for the West. He sees their one world government. He sees their one world bank. He sees their one world church. He sees the Antichrist in charge of it all. One man given power in all three of those phases. And he will control the lives of every single person who's alive. You will not do anything without his acknowledgement, his permission. If you defy his edicts, his mandate, His laws, His orders, you will die. In fact, four billion people will die in three and a half years under Him. Did you catch that? See, that that number overwhelms us. We can't can't wrap our minds around four billion people. World War II, we lost 50 uh, 50 million people. Can you imagine one half of the world's population dead in three and a half years To establish a new world order. John looks down and he sees China. The great army from the east on the march. 
a 200 million man army crossing the Euphrates River and headed to Israel for a showdown for who's going to rule the world to conclude World War III. He sees a world of destruction and death everywhere. He sees psychopaths roaming the streets who will murder people just for the pleasure of killing them. He sees perverts who will violate and brutalize people. He sees demonic prisoners who have been released from the pit. And they will roam the earth and molest and rape people. He sees that. Oh, how he must cry as his planet and his people are going through such. He sees. He looks up, he looks around, he looks back. And he looks down. Let us pray.